I call this uh, meeting of the Conroe Independent School Board of Trustees to order. Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that the notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 6 p.m. All right, Mr. Husband, if you don't mind, would you lead us in our join invocation me. and pledge? If you so wish, please join me in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the, all the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Father, uh, tonight we just want to thank you for our awesome teachers and staff and bus drivers and all our auxiliary personnel in our administration and how hard they work for the success of our children. And Father, we want to thank you for the, the, their, their successes and, and, and how sweet they are, and yet the lessons from their losses, Father, they're oh so important in a, in a, in a well-balanced life. And we thank you ahead of time for their safety and their happiness and their learning and their abilities. We, we are so very blessed as a community. Now, Father, we'd ask that you be with us as we make the decisions for your district and that they would be pleasing unto you in all that we do. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Now if you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Husband. Item 2A, Awards and Recognition, Special District Award, Read for a Better Life Initiative. Dr. No. All right, thank you, sir. Well, this is uh, absolutely my favorite board meeting of the year, and I... I do love all board meetings, sirs, but um, this is my favorite one of the years. We have an opportunity to have children here and read to children. But before we invite the students up, I would like to recognize a special group of people that I see back here. And uh, we'll talk about reading a lot tonight and the champions for reading in our buildings. Uh, we're so appreciative of our librarians. And so if, if our librarians would stand up so we could thank you. You know, we, we are um, special in, in many ways as a district, and one of those ways is that we believe in what librarians do. And we believe in the impact that librarians make, and a lot of school districts and a lot of school boards uh, have historically discounted that fact and, and not made librarians a priority, but it's never been the case in our district, and we're so thankful you. for you all. Absolutely. So tonight we have an honor of having uh, some second graders here with us tonight. Uh, and they are from Anderson Elementary. Who's from Anderson Elementary? Raise your hand if you go to Anderson Elementary. Let's see. Oh, okay. They're here. Okay. So we have Miss Jenkins' class and Miss James' class. So if you are in one of those classes, and maybe even if you're a little brother or sister of one of those students, y'all come on this way. Come up here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on up, guys. Hey, all right. There we go. Now we're, oh, she's on board. No, all right. That's okay. There you go. I don't think. I don't think. In the future, she'll be all over it. That's right. That's right. So this is a very special class. Uh, this is one of our dual language classes. So we have now in two of our schools, we have programs where we offer dual language. So we have students that are native Spanish speakers and students that are native English speakers. By the time they finish this program, they will both they will be uh, literate in both English and Spanish and be highly skilled in both languages. And what a gift that is to come out of elementary school with that gift. So, and we. We, we have a whole group of special kiddos here, but we have one kind of celebrity. Uh, Mikaelin, you want to wave to everybody? So um, for the staff in the room, you may remember Mikaelin, she read the book to you at the Celebrate Our Schools. 
and did it so well. And now I have to try to follow her tonight, which was <laughs> probably a big mistake on my part. But maybe um, y'all want to introduce yourselves? You think you can even want to tell everybody your name? You need, can you say it into the microphone? My name is Sebastian, and, and my last name is Gonzalez. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. My, my name is Michaela Giselle Schultz. Okay. My name is Camila Gutierrez. Okay, perfect. My name is Cynthia Cruz. Okay, you want to go? My name is Bella. Okay, you got it? <laughs> my name is Natalie Villajan. Okay, say it loud. My name is Sophia Ortiz. Okay. My name is Brian Martinez. Okay. My name is Anthony Rodriguez. My name is Brody Wilson. Awesome. Let's give a hand to all these guys. Okay. Well, I'm going to sit here. So if you all want to come sit in front of me, like come to the carpet right here. So the book that we read earlier this year that actually McKaylin read to all the teachers uh, was called Scribble Stones, and it was by Diane Alber. She, she was the author, and we really liked that book. And so um, because we liked that book so much, one of, the, one of the things we can do when we read a book and we really like it is to look up the author and see, see I knew she'd warm up. Um, is to look up the author and see if the author's written any other books that we might also like. And so we looked up the author and we found more books that she wrote. And she's also the illustrator. What does that mean? She's the illustrator. Yes. She also made the picture. So she's really, really talented lady that she could do both, right? So but we found a few books. And this one that we're going to read today is called I'm Not Just a Scribble. Okay. And so I'm going to read it, and then you'll have all the pictures will be on the screens as well. Because while my wife is a pre-K teacher, I was a high school guy, and I'm not great at being able to read like this. It's not my, it is not my talent. We all must know our limitations. This is a story about Scribble, whose lines would cross and wiggle. Tiny loops would start him small. Bigger swirls would make him tall. He could be shades of green or baby blue, even crazy colors. He loved them too. Choosing bright colors made him feel free. You never knew which one he would be. Then one day, Scribble took a short walk where he found a house and stopped to talk. Hello, said Scribble. It's such a great day. I thought I'd come over and we could all play. The house never saw anything like Scribble before, but he was curious enough to find out a bit more. So even though he was grumpy and didn't want to play, he still managed to grunt, What are you anyway? Scribble was confused and didn't know what to say. So he said to the house, I'm just a scribble. Is that okay? It's not okay, said the house. You don't look right. Your lines aren't straight and your colors are too bright. That's not very nice. Uh, not very nice. But color is fun, Scribble said. I can show you why. Just give me a chance. Please let me try. No, said the house. You cannot stay. You're nothing like me. Now go away. I, I might not have picked a very nice book. <laughs> Hearing those words made Scribble so sad. A tear ran down his face and he felt really bad. But I won't be upset. He proclaimed that day, so he changed his colors and he went on his way. He continued his walk and soon found the sun, along with the clouds. They could all have some fun. But the sun saw him coming and told him to stop. Your lines are too messy. 
and we don't have a mop. Turn around, little scribble, he went on to say. Go back to your home. Please just go away. But you're not being nice, Scribble shouted, quite mad. The fact that I'm different doesn't make me so bad. My colors are special and my lines are just fine. If you'd give me a chance, we could have a great time. Should we ask them to play? They huddled to discuss. It's fun with more friends, but it's usually just us. And although they were worried this wouldn't work out, being mean to Scribble wasn't what they were all about. Scribble was surprised at what he saw the next day. All the drawings were there and they wanted to play. Even Rainbow showed up and he never came by. He was standing right there near the sun in the sky. We're so sorry, said the clouds, as they held back their tears. Please come and play, said the house. We haven't had fun in years. Oh, they got nicer. I feel better already. I forgive you, Scribble shouted, and he did a happy dance. They were so grateful, he gave them another chance. Scribble gathered up his colors and played with everyone. Blue, purple, green, and yellow. It was all so much fun. <laughs> Look what they created when they finally came together. The art was so beautiful, and it was better than ever. <clears throat> Did y'all like that book? Yes. How were you feeling at the beginning of the book? Michaela, how were you feeling at the beginning when they were being mean? We were, they were sad for Scribble. What else? Who else was, was anybody else feeling sad for Scribble? How did you feel when the clouds decided that they were going to be nice? Yes. Yeah, I felt happier too. I'm glad it ended on a happy note. It would have been really bad if it didn't. <laughs> we would have all gone home sad. But we're so happy that they all got to play. And I'm so happy that you all came tonight to hear a book. And tomorrow is a very special day in Conroe ISD as we will be out uh, all through our school district. Community members will be reading books and hopefully you will have some special readers in your classes tomorrow. Um, I know that Ms. Keonis probably has readers lined up that are gonna come and see you uh, in your classroom. And so um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be at Anderson tomorrow, but I'll be at many schools tomorrow as well. And I might take her with me. <laughs> <laughs> So um, let's give a hand to these kiddos one more time. Y'all wanna come up and let's take a picture? Wanna come up and stand around me? All right. Are we in here? You wanna come stand over here? Wanna stand right here? No? You can hold the book. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> I would also like to recognize Ms. Keona as the principal of Anderson. If you were away, we're so proud of her. And I think we may have a little, do we have something, Ms. Katie? Yes. We have little presents for you all. Yay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome, baby. That's pretty nice, huh? You're very welcome. Sorry, we just ran out. We like gifts too? Yeah. Okay. Oh, hang on one second. I'm going to be here for one second. All right, I do, I do want to show y'all one thing. It'll be later. Yeah. So, our next item, she's just going to, like, I can tell. She's the boss. <laughs> I have one of those, too. She's now 16, but she's still the boss. Um, so 
just for the next item, in case you were in case you were wondering, I'm not going to explain it now. But uh, as I was reading, you might have noticed that I had on some special socks today. Um, they're they're pretty cool. And the next item we're going to talk about, you're going to learn more about the socks. But before I got hidden behind the desk, I want to just show them off a little bit, and maybe you'll get another chance to see them on a young man here in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. So, thank you uh, all for giving me that opportunity. Anytime. Just appreciate right. it. Appreciate you. All right. Good segue. Item 2B, Special Board Recognition, Patrons, Influence, and Education Education Pie Award. Dr. Okay. No? All right. Ms. Denise Cipolla, our Coordinator of Guidance and Counseling, will present this title. Good evening. And it is really a pleasure for me to make this introduction and present this. Um, about five years ago, I met an amazing young man. Um, he was wanting to help his fellow kids in his schools, in our community, and anyone that was um, food insecure. He wanted to, uh, it's called Matthew's birthday wish. And his birthday wish that year was um, not to get presents, but for his friends to come with him to collect donations of food and to organize packages um, that would be distributed at his school and neighboring schools. And I remember meeting with him that day as he talked about his program and showed me a prototype of what he intended to do. And he said uh, to Dr. Stockton and I, he said, just give me five years. Wait and see in five years. Well, this is our fifth year. And it was so proud, I was so proud when Good Morning America this July um, presented him with recognition during their Houston visit. Uh, and also, the mayor of Houston declared for now and forever July 10th as Matthew Real Day. Um, today, Matthew. Yes. Today, Matthew serves 63 of our students at three of our schools, um, and he weekly provides um, food for them for the weekend. Not only that, um, he has inspired adults and other students, um, other kids, to be giving of the community around them. Um, much of our community, both businesses, schools, and individuals, Boy Scout troops, all support his uh, food drives that then goes back into the weekly donations that he makes at our schools. It's much more than that. If he knows that one in the, if someone in the family is having a birthday, he provides a birthday cake. Um, and Thanksgiving, they provide meals uh, for the family. Um, and much of the time, Matthew's donations include things they can't get from normal food bank resources, uh, fresh meats and, and produce, and things that are donated to his, his um, group. So. He's an amazing young man. The, the socks that you saw are uh, money making for his, uh, it's, it's in order to feed the funds and to um, you know, have the donations to his foundation so that he can provide even more to our families. And so it's my pleasure to introduce you, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you. school district. We really appreciate that. And so 
uh, we do have an award to give you the, uh, the patron uh, patron influencing education award for matthew real matthew's birthday wish by the Conroe isd school district now you'll notice that today is not july 10th but the reason it's july 10th is because as it was pointed out with good morning america uh, they uh, and the, the mayor, Sylvester Turner, down in Houston, declared July 10th, uh, now and forever, <coughs> Matthew, Matthew Real Day. So we wanted to recognize that and give you this plaque. And also, it is a pie award, so you get a pie. <laughs> <laughs> you can do with this what you wish. We want to recognize you. Thank you for everything you do. So, uh, okay. We'd like to recognize you know, this young man. He does a lot of stuff, but what he can do is he can't drive. <laughs> so none of this happens without the great efforts of mom and dad. So if you would please stand up so we can recognize you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. But firstly, it's almost, I mean, it's always promising to see young folks like yourself do great things like you're doing. But how can we get a hold to the socks yeah. one? And how can I get one of those suits too? <laughs> <laughs> All right, she can hook them up with the sock. That's what that's. <laughs> you don't have those? I'm working on it. I got to get that one in my collection. Yeah. So outstanding job, parents. I appreciate it. And uh, Matthew, outstanding job. Again, you set an example for everybody, Thank adults you. and kids alike. Thank so, you. Yeah. Good job, man. Thank you all. Phenomenal. Yeah, We're blessed to good. have you, man. Easy to do. Good job, brother. Thank you all. All right. I want to give everybody uh, an opportunity to get the kiddos to bed right now and kind of sneak on out of here. And Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Get ready for tomorrow. Thanks for coming, everybody. Just watch That's what comes. Not bad. It's just tired. All right, guys. Item uh, 2C citizen participation. Ms. Godfrey, has anyone registered to address the board? Yes, they have. All right. The next item on the agenda is public comment from those who have registered to address the board in accordance to board policy BED. Please keep in mind that this is portion of the meeting is not the appropriate form for bringing complaints of which resolution is sought. Complaints must be addressed by the following by the following the by following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures before they can be submitted to the board of trustees as an agenda item. The board has no obligation to project has an obligation to protect confidentiality of information that personally identifies a student. Therefore, unless you are talking about your own child or you are over the age of 18 of age, if you're over the age of 18, speaking about yourself, the board cannot permit comments that include student names or any information that might identify a specific student. If an issue is mentioned that is on tonight's posted agenda, the board would defer its discussion of the item of the issue until the item is reached on the agenda. For any subject that is not on the board's agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make a decision, but it can furnish specific factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to no more than five minutes for their presentation. Ms. Goffrey, please call the first person. Nicole May. Hi, 
Hi, uh, I'm very nervous, never done anything like this before, okay. but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about reading and dyslexia, oddly enough, so I'll take that as a sign that the librarians are here. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. good evening, members of the board and Dr. Null. I'm here tonight to begin talking to you all about dyslexia and dyslexia services within our district. I will start by telling you that I am pro-teacher, pro-campus, and pro-district. I would like to share our family's story, some concerns and requests, and a little bit about a group of stakeholders here in our state and in our community. I am the mother of two dyslexic sons. My oldest son is 13 in seventh grade, and my youngest son is eight in third grade. Midway through my oldest son's first year of kindergarten, the teacher and counselor called me in for a conference. We were told Maddox needed to repeat kinder due to reading readiness. Midway through his second year of kinder, it was obvious something was wrong. I took him to the pediatrician to help diagnose the problem. He was unwilling to diagnose because he suspected more learning issues at play. We took Maddox to a licensed school psychologist that had done contract work for CISD. She diagnosed Maddox with dyslexia and dysgraphia. We then fought with the district for the next year and a half to accept the dyslexia diagnosis and provide Maddox with the dyslexia intervention he desperately needed. At the end of his first grade year, at the age of eight, we made it to due process. We were tired of the fight and low on funds. We decided to switch gears and abandon the legal process so that we could get our son the help he desperately needed. Maddox attended dyslexia's tutoring with basic language skills of four, four days a week, an hour before school for three years. Today, he is an excellent student. The district eventually accepted his diagnosis and he is now covered in under 504. Midway through my youngest son's first grade year, it became obvious to all that we again had a problem. He was screened for dyslexia and sure enough, he too is dyslexic. He was placed in basic language skills through the school. We were relieved. We had early intervention and we knew basic language skills worked. He attended basic language skills for 30 minutes a day, four days a week. He shared this time period with up to five other kids. Midway through his second grade year, I met with our principal. We were both concerned because he was not making progress and was still falling behind. I requested an FIE, which revealed he qualified for special education. The program offered to our son through special education is LLI, which is guided reading. I reached out to numerous dyslexia experts. Not one of these experts recommended LLI as an appropriate program for dyslexia. We were back to private tutoring. The cost to our family for my oldest son's testing, advocacy, and intervention was upwards $20,000. My youngest son's private tutoring costs $500 a week for three years. This is a burden to our family, but we feel the stakes are high. Our story is not rare, just as dyslexia is not rare. One in five is dyslexic. Recently, Dr. Null tweeted out how fast our district is growing. I believe the current enrollment he quoted was six. 64,628 students in our mighty district. If we break that down for dyslexics, that means our district has approximately 12,925 dyslexic students. Do we have the resources in place to effectively intervene on all these kids' behalf? And do we have a plan in place to grow our dyslexia department as our, dyslex as our district grows? These are my concerns. Number one, in my opinion, 30 minutes of vital dyslexia intervention is not enough. The manual for the new program CISD adopted this year, Reading by Design, states 30 to 45 minutes. Why would we not give these students the extra 15 minutes? That's an additional two hours of service a week and approximately an additional 70 hours a year of vital intervention. I can imagine the dyslexia teachers themselves would be more effective with this small yet very big amount of time. Number two, why do our dyslexic, dyslexic kids share the short time with so many other students? How can we expect the dyslexic, dyslexia teachers to be effective? And how can we expect our dyslexic students to soak in this life, these life-changing lessons with so many other kids present? Do we need more dyslexia teachers on staff? I am guessing the answer is yes. Ideally, it would be great if we had one dyslexia teacher per campus. Yet most of our dyslexia teachers currently have numer numerous campuses they service. How do we change the current state of our dyslexia department? I am honestly asking, 
and will, as a parent, do all I can to make these change ha changes happen for all dyslexia students in our district. While our family has the extra income to supplement with tutoring, many families are unable to do this. In fact, one family I know described this as a crisis for them. At the end of last year, I reached out to our state representative for Decoding Dyslexia. Decoding Dyslexia is a grassroots organization of fellow moms with kids that are dyslexic. The organization began years ago up north and has spread like wildfire in our country. They have effectively lobbied to help get dyslexia laws in place in many states. There was even an article written about them in Time Magazine's July edition. The formula is simple, organized by district using Facebook as the medium. Last April, we launched our Facebook group for CISD parents. To date, we have over 100 strong and are very active. We are growing slowly to get roots in place for the long haul. We exist to provide information, resources, and encouragement. We also exist to begin encouraging change here in our district. I'm guessing not much will change after hearing this short speech. However, we plan to continue showing up on a regular basis and discussing the needs of all dyslexic students in our district. I would like to leave you with a quote from our last stakeholders meeting that I attended in our state capitol just last month. The quote is from Dr. Sharon Vaughn. Reading is the green card that gets you access to the world. Thank you for your time and dedication to dyslexic students in our district. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Carrie Clark. Freemeyer. I could yield my time. But, uh, <laughs> I, just real quick, I just wanted to uh, speak on behalf of uh, Texas State Teachers Association. Um, we are very thankful and appreciative for uh, all that you do and all your support uh, for the employees of Connor ISD. We thank you for the salary increase as well. And this year is going off really uh, very, very strong. And with your support, it's even uh, better. And I just also wanted to throw in that we have uh, solidified our uh, salute to education teacher of the year <coughs> ceremony already so uh may 7th get that in your books may 7th okay so that's all i wanted to say thank you again and we're really pushing uh making this a uh, bond happen and um if you need us we're here and available uh we'll have i'll have some of my members uh talk about the bond as well so Thank you again for Thank everything that you do. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And we can always use your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, item three, consent agenda. I'm going to move remove item D off the consent agenda. I haven't received a request out other than that as it relates to removing anything off the consent agenda. So. I'd like to entertain a motion, if you will, to accept the consent agenda, absent item D. So moved. A second. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All opposed? I'm sorry. <laughs> all four? <laughs> all right. All opposed. All right. Here we are. Good deal. All right. Now, item uh, 3D, consider resolution um, approving the investment program and the list of qualified investment brokers. Uh, Mr. Mr. Sanders. President, I just want to state that I have a conflict of interest because my employer is listed as one of the vendors, and so I will not be participating in discussion or vote. Move the adoption of item. Okay, we have a motion. We got another. Exam. Yeah, I could take a motion a second, but then I still have to go to Mr. Huber. Yeah, I I, um, I plan on the, on abstaining as well. I I don't work for one of the vendors, but it's a sister company. So just to be clear and and fair I, I i i plan on abstaining as well all right note it mr husband a motion you had a motion we had this motion and second uh any discussion all in favor all right all opposed abstentions thank you gentlemen appreciate that all right uh, <clears throat> item four curriculum and instruction consider adoption <clears throat> for a read for a better life resolution dr no dr hines Good evening, President Williams, 
members of the board, Dr. Noll. Reading is a fundamental to the academic success of children. The Connor Independent School District recognizes that the single most important activity to build the knowledge required for the eventual success in reading is reading aloud to children. Reading aloud builds sound and word awareness and stimulates language development. It helps children to practice listening and provides students with a greater range of experiences. In addition, the nurturing attention from parents during reading encourages children to form a positive association with reading. Reading to children builds motivation, curiosity, and memory. Reading is not only a vital skill and a fundamental function of today's society, but reading is a gateway to new ideas, to learning, and provides fuel for the imagination. Therefore, the Board of Trustees are respectfully <clears throat> requested to consider the adoption of the uh, resolution that you have before you, which proclaims that the staff of the Conroe Independent School District will support Read for a Better Life and authorizes the district to enlist the support of the parents and community of CISD to read aloud to every student 30 minutes of every day. I move we approve as presented. I second the motion. I don't know, we have a motion second in discussion. All in favor? Outstanding. All right, item five, administration, consider accept, accepting the Texas Commission uh, for Environmental Quality, Texas Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Program Grant. <laughs> That's quite a title, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Ahead, Baker, you please present this. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Nall. Uh, I would like to ask your uh, consideration of the recommendation uh, to approve the grant um, presented by the uh, Texas Commission for Environmental Quality, Texas Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Program. Uh, the Conroe Independent School District applied for and was awarded uh, this grant uh, which may reimburse the district up to $1,652,792 toward the purchase of 2019 and 2020 uh, buses of the same type fuel capacity. Uh, and with the grant, uh, it allows us to replace up to 20 buses uh, of a similar type uh, that would do uh, its part for lower emissions. The cost of new school buses is approximately $103,000 to $115,000. This grant will provide up to 80% of the cost to a maximum of $73,800 for diesel buses or $106,400 for propane buses, whichever is less. In order to receive this funding, the school district must agree to operate the buses for at least five years, uh, and must decommission the buses being replaced within 90 days uh, of receipt of the new buses by scrapping and removing those buses uh, from the roadways of Texas. Uh, Conroe ISD is requesting the board's approval to accept the grant. I make a motion. All right, we have a motion. A second. 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 A second now, discussion, gentlemen. Yeah, uh, could you repeat uh, the propane and the diesel bus uh, uh, reimbursement or? Mm -hmm. Allowance or whatever it's called. Uh, for the uh, diesel buses, the amount is seventy three thousand eight hundred. Uh, for propane, one hundred and six thousand four hundred. And do you know, uh, uh, Caker, if uh, propane buses are more expensive? They are. By how much? Uh, I don't know exactly. Sam Sam's here. Versus 103. Sure. That's a pretty good margin. It is. I mean, and the it's cost a pretty good margin on the buses, but it's even a better margin on the grant. Yes. And and uh, just to clarify, with regard to the grant, um, we had to identify in advance buses that meet the criteria that we would agree to take out of service. And because of our fleet structure, we have far more diesel buses than we have propane buses, but we've identified both categories in the grant funding, and we will be replacing with both categories through the grant funding. And you have to replace, like, you can't go to propane from diesel, retire a diesel and, and get the grant for a propane. It has to be like- Like to, to like. like, yeah. My question has been answered, thank you, sir. All right, I have a couple discussion, questions too. So uh, in addition, 
Can you help remind me our fleet average number of years? 11 point 11, 5, 12 years old. 12 years okay. old. Yeah. So we're going to keep the buses five years. That's not an issue no. at all. And then the other issue is all of them will be air conditioned and have seat yes, belts. Sir. Yes. Is my understanding as well. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Because we do still have some buses without AC. We do. Okay. And so hopefully we're replacing we are. those. Yes. Yes. These are uh, 90 uh, up to 2004 <clears throat> models. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Motion second. Gentlemen, all, all in approve. In favor? Motion passes. Thank you. All right, item 5B, consider entering into an adjunct faculty agreement with Texas A&M. Dr. No. Yes. Uh, there was a whole lot more to go there. Uh, <laughs> no more interruptions hey. in the board meetings. <laughs> From bearded fellas. Says the Longhorn. We have a choice. of President Williams, members of the board, Dr. No. Uh, this agreement uh, or this request tonight is that you approve. Uh, we enter into an agreement for <clears throat> adjunct faculty uh, with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and then delegate the superintendent the authority to execute the agreement in all future similar faculty ad adjunct positions, as well to authorize the superintendent <clears throat> to annually affirm the board's prior resolution, which was done about five years ago, four years ago. Um, so we have previously done a resolution. This allows uh, students that participate in 4-H uh, if with the approval of the principal, if they go to that activity, we can count them president school because we have an adjunct staff member with them. And so that's really what this, but two parts tonight to approve it. And then if, if possible, authorize Dr. Noll to approve similar agreements in the future. Okay. I move that we uh, approve as presented. I have a motion, a second. second, second, any discussion? I think it's a great idea to make sure that the students that aren't participating in ag on campus have other opportunities through 4-H. And I like the idea a lot. I think it's great to have you. You're going to get some top notch professional uh, people with Texas A&M. Great job. All right. All in favor? Motion passes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hines. Uh, item C, receive update on attendance zones for um, Dr. Uh, how you do this? Doctor <coughs> Junior High School? <laughs> yeah, yes. All right. Just, do we need doctor? Just you don't pause. Doctor. Just it sounded awful. This one might be a little more complicated, Dr. Hines, than the last one. Huh? <laughs> Tonight, I wanted to give you an update uh, regarding the process for uh, redoing the attendance boundaries for junior highs here in Conroe. This will coincide with the opening of Stockton Junior High School. And then we hope to, I hope to be back here in a month or so to talk about the process that we'll use to uh, reduce some crowding at Ride Elementary. So um, two different processes, but tonight we're going to talk about uh, st <coughs> Stockton Junior High School. We will be opening this new junior high school, approximately a capacity of 1,450 students in August of 2020. It's going to serve students in grades seven and eight, and it's going to be located at 2750 Excellence Avenue. If you're not familiar with that location, it is adjacent to Bosman Intermediate School. Just a quick reminder of the layout of that site. To the left is 3083, and to the right is Loop 336, and in between you can see where we have Patterson, Bosman, uh, Stockton Junior High, and then of course the future location of a high school. And also you can see the police department over there that faces uh, to the loop. This is a fairly recent, not, not as recent as what you'll see later, but picture the junior high under construction. You can see the two campuses in the background to kind of get oriented. Uh, this is some of the renderings of the school. It's the athletic side. This is kind of off of the back of the cafeteria. The library, classroom view. You know, we get the question of why do we have to do this? Why do we have to redraw boundaries? Um, and it's not because we get we get bored and don't have anything to do. Uh, it is uh, the most common reason is that we adjust attendance boundaries that we open new schools to meet the growth. And the district is growing. And over time, um, sometimes we see some shifts in student population due to changes in density. An area might age. An area might renew. Um, so we we see 
uh, a variety of reasons why a school might become overcrowded or underutilized, and which will then cause us to go back and look at um, some rezoning. Uh, on September the 12th of this year, our enrollment was 64,748. We ended the year with an enrollment of 63,094. That's an increase of 1,650 students from where we finished the year. Um, it's up by over 2,000, by 2,051 students from where we were on September 6, 2018, just to put that in perspective. So growth is happening. Uh, and we're continuing to grow. We're going to need the seats. Um, Pete Junior High has a capacity of 1,450. We currently have 1,448 students there with two portable classrooms. And it's, it's probably a good reminder. I get that question a lot about capacity, and it's probably one of the hardest things to explain because it's very fluid. Um, but, but generally, when we talk about a capacity of building, we're talking about the, the ability of the core of the facility in terms of what it can support. The actual classrooms have so many variables. Uh, we could swing by 10% either way due to special programs. And so um, it's really hard to put a true capacity on a, on a school building. But, but generally, when we talk about it, it's for uh, the core facilities and what it might look like. Um, but it could swing one way or the other. That's Pete's a really good example. We're right at capacity, and we have two portable classrooms. We're off by about two rooms. Um, it could have swung two rooms the other way. Washington Junior High has a capacity of 700 students, and it has an enrollment currently of 964 students utilizing 11 portable classrooms. Uh, just a reminder, Washington Junior High School will be repurposed as Washington High School, allowing programs that are currently at Hawk to relocate to that current junior high school site after we open Stockton Junior High School. And what that means is we will be uh, adding 750 additional junior high seats in the Conroe feeder system next year. So that's the net gain for us. It's a challenging process uh, from experience of, you know, what we know is that schools are communities. Uh, families often have a history of attending a particular school. Families often choose where they uh, live to attend a particular school. But we have to look at the 10 year projection, and the 10 year projection for the current Conroe High School feeder for the junior high enrollment is roughly 3,500 students. So you can do the math 2,900 seats, 3,500 students is where we likely will be in 10 years. Um, so that we know um, that we have to look at this very intentionally. So this is not going to be a 10 year solution, but roughly a five to seven year solution. And we know that in five or seven years, we'll be back with another plan to, to try to uh, look at what we're gonna do for junior high growth. So what are we trying to do or accomplish in this process? Well, first we're gonna develop a attendance boundary to populate Stockton Junior High School. And we do wanna leave a little bit of room for growth, um, but where we're really trying to leave room for growth is gonna be at Pete Junior High School because Pete is growing faster than what is currently the Washington zone. And um, our most recent demographic studies projects Pete to be at over 2,400 students by 2028, while Washington would be roughly at around 1,100 students in 2028. So knowing that, the, the difference in the growth um, we're going to try to, to, to move at least uh, somewhere in that 300 to 450 student range in order to allow some room to grow back at Pete. Um, at the same time, we know um, what is currently our Washington zone is continuing to grow. Washington's up roughly 100 students over last year. So we're going to have to continue to watch uh, that. But, but our objective is to try to create some additional room at P. And, that, and that's just something we always have to start kind of wrapping our head around. When we finish this process, Stockton may be bigger than P. And I just want to point that out. It may not, but it may be. And if it is, it'll be intentional because we're trying to make room at P for future growth. To do that, we're going to form a committee. And you can uh, just quickly look at and see we have principals and some district staff members on the committee as well as parents. And we have a very good um, kind of a representation geographically from throughout our district, throughout the Conroe feeder. We also included representation from uh, Austin Elementary as well, because um, parts of Austin Elementary uh, are right up against uh, the Patterson zone, and we've done some moving and some flipping uh, the last few years. We want to include uh, that area in the discussion. We have several goals, and I, I won't read them all to you. I'll just highlight a few. 
we know that we put students first in this process. We're, we're always trying to be effective and efficient in drawing these boundaries. We do want to plan for future growth. Uh, we are trying to reduce some crowding or coming of the overcrowded campus. We, one of our goals is to communicate through this process. And when we get to the end, we'll show you a little bit about our website, what we do. Um, and then the other part is we have a committee so that we get good, broad representation and feedback. We have several considerations. These are not in a particular order, but we look at all these sort of factors, campus capacity, input. We look at demographic factors. We look at feeder patterns, school history. We look at ge geography in terms of proximity. Um, we look at location of existing neighborhoods and communities, natural boundaries, waterways, freeways, railroad tracks, those kinds of things. We try to minimize the impact on families. We look to see if we've been rezoning a lot recently. In this case, we have not. We have not done any major junior high rezoning recently in the Conroe area. Um, we try to also look at projected future enrollments. And so we're really trying to think down the road where we need to be. Uh, we also want to look at transportation patterns and some other considerations. So those are some of the things we're going to do. Um, the committee. We'll have its first meeting in about two weeks. That'll start a process. We will uh, have three rounds of basic public presentations, but, but everything we'll have will also be available on the website. Um, the first round is more or less kind of going out and, and really explaining this is what's going on, this is what we're looking at, this is what our objectives are. Uh, the second part, we'll come back, we'll put together scenarios, we'll narrow down our scenarios, we'll bring those scenarios out for feedback, whatever we come up with. We'll try to narrow. Uh, and then the final round in early January, we go back is usually just to show what the committee is going to recommend to you in January. Uh, we try to make it known uh, before we come and bring it forward. Um, so very similar process we went through with just with Suchma and uh, with Grand Oaks rezoning. And so we plan to do that again, unless you want us to change something or have any uh, thing you'd like us to consider. Um, <clears throat> I, I do want to show you the website. I, I also want to stress we understand the significance of this process. We don't take it lightly. We do try to, to, to look at it very carefully. Uh, we do feel strongly that um, our schools are very good and that we're going to be able to offer uh, quality programs wherever students are zoned to, to attend. We are going to shoot for a, random, a January um, date to try to bring you a recommendation. I will come back before January just to give you an update of where we're at and how it's going. Uh, this is our website. So you can kind of see um, what it looks like. We will have our committee. We give some background. Uh, we try to answer some of those questions. We list uh, our goals. Uh, we also have the considerations. And then if we go down a little bit, we have a link to the website. Uh, which can get people more information if they want to go to the Stockton Junior High website to get specific information. We also have on our uh, zoning page, we have uh, a breakdown of the meeting dates, the community presentations. We also have some resources, some additional resources uh, you can see, such as the, uh, the current feeder maps, the way our schools feed, um, as well as the PASA update. We're also going to put up, and we do this every time, we've been doing this about the last four or five of these that we've done, we put up Excel sheets so that if people want to submit to the committee for review their own suggested ways of redoing the boundaries, we give them the, the worksheet so they can do it as well and submit those. Yes, sir? Do you, do you, prefer, do you prefer not to take any questions tonight? Or? You can. Yes, sir, as you want to ask now or where? Well, I just, I was going to ask, is this a change in the junior high feeder zone? Is that going to dictate, mandate, or otherwise imply a change to the intermediate zone that feeds them? It's, it's a great question. We've I'm sure it's not mandated. It's not, it's know. not mandating. And certainly right now, managing the intermediate numbers is a whole nother task. And we have currently several split intermediate schools. So we are not approaching this with the need to go back and align the intermediate schools. We will look at it. And it's certainly <laughs> maps that we share. and We have that information for the committee, but it's not our number one objective. Our number one objective is to solve for junior high. But if you don't do that now, and you know, you got that beautiful kind of muted out 
picture of a new high school there. <laughs> or when, when you do rezone for a high school, aren't you going to then, aren't you then going to have to, I mean, or intermediates going to stay out of that fray? Yes. That's what I would say intermediates will stay out of that fray. That is their intent. Okay. And that's you. that's currently what we do now is that we try not we, we try to do it as pure as we can, but it just at some point we have split intermediates mm -hmm. such as Wilkerson splits and um, there's a few others Collins. that split. Uh, Collins has some split in it, I think, a little bit. Uh, again, I wasn't trying to get you to solve the problem no. tonight. I was just in general, I was asking. So thank you. Dr. Hines, yes, sir. You, you probably know what I'm going to say because you've heard me say it so many times, either as a parent on these attendance boundary committees or when you bring this yes, forward. Sir. But just in preparation for your January presentation, I know y'all have demographics listed. Um, but if you could, please, you know, I'm going to ask in January about the SES numbers and what this yes, does sir. to our existing campuses and potential loss or gain of Title I funding, things like that. So. I'll just prepare you for that question. We'll have that. It's, and it's on all of our calculations <laughs> that we run. So yes, sir. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Hines. Thank, Thank you for you. your hard work. I'll stand at job. We understand how much work goes into drafting this and how much flack you guys receive, but you always do a phenomenal job at keeping the disruptions to the family you know, at a minimum. So great job, Dr. Hines and, and staff and committee. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. All right. Item D, consider a consider resolution adopting prevailing wage rates for public works projects. Dr. Ano. All right. Mr. Foster will come up to present the next few items. That's easy. All right, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. It's my, my pleasure to bring forward for your consideration the approval and adoption of a uh, prevailing wage rate for public works projects. This is something we do on about a three-year cycle, approximately. It's not exactly, but approximately every three years. So Texas, Texas Government Code Chapter 2258 requires that public school districts adopt a prevailing wage rate that sets the minimum hourly wages for construction workers on public works projects or construction projects that are funded with public funds. So PBK on behalf of Texas public school districts, specifically in the Gulf Coast area, conducts a prevailing wage survey approximately every three years to develop the wage scale that we're adopting tonight by resolution. So the scale, is, uh, the wage scale is actually attached as an exhibit uh, in your board book. And tonight we're asking you uh, approval to adopt that resolution. Gentlemen, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion second discussion. I have a question, Mr. Foster. So I saw the rates for each of the job categories, but I didn't see a comparison to what it was before. Can you tell me on average about what the level of increase is, percentage increase from I, I the last one we did? Yeah, well, the last one we, we did was in March of 2016. Right. So as we, as you would expect, the, the I don't have an average because it varies a little bit from category to category. Right. Uh, but it was a, an incremental increase of a small, small amount. So, but it's important to note the wage scale. So it's not just construction companies and private companies. This includes public entities like Conroe ISD, other ISDs in the district, big, small, uh, big companies, little companies. So it, it does uh, make the numbers look, uh, I mean, that's, the small increment is very small. I mean, it's not, a, not huge leap. That's not something we would expect, especially from somebody who's trying to, control the cost of projects but sure no, no, it is no, setting a minimum cost that has to be paid on our jobs which we take into account when we're doing our budgets so is it i mean three five two three five ten fifteen what, i'm just looking for an idea i don't can I you hold you to it but i'm just i think much like mr foster indicated the first phase of classification it sounds like it's going to be That, that's fine. Thank you. So the other question I had was about, so we're setting the minimum. That doesn't mean, though, that that's what they're going to get. Many times they're making above that, depending on their years of experience and knowledge and that kind of thing. Is that my understanding as well? Yes, that is, that is that what we encounter. So we're well. not really setting their wage rate. We're just setting the minimum wage rate. That's correct. Okay. 
and we have two or three or four sets of eyes between CMs and internal auditors and everybody that's guaranteeing that those are actually being. Well, made. I mean, so in order to guarantee they're being done would require us to look uh, very deep, like, like on a certified pay scale job, which would not use this pay wage scale, use the Davis Bacon wage scale. Mm -hmm. That's mandatory. So we do a, a spot check when we go through okay. our, our, our processes with our, myself, with, uh, as we're reviewing, matter of fact, we're doing one for Clark right now questioning how much uh, individuals are being paid on that on that job. Uh, we did it in depth at Grand Oaks uh, with our external auditing firm. So it is part of our normal, normal process. I know we just got here, but for what it's worth, I checked those prices in the board book and I do some GC work as some of you might know. And I thought those were, I was surprised that actually I pay more than that. So I thought those were excellent prices, uh, wages. They're minimum. Yeah, we'll probably yeah, pay more. Yeah. As minimums. Yes. Well, I pay more than those do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where That's do you get I, your guys? I'd like the list, please. Well, that's why I want to point out it's not just private entities, entities no. that are interviewed. They're public and private entities, so we get we get both ends of the spectrum. Thank you, Mr. Foster. We have a motion second, gentlemen. Any more discussion? All right. All in favor? All right, motion passes. Um, item E, consider acceptance of Grand Oaks High School construction project. All right, Mr. Foster. At this time, I'd like to bring forward for your uh, acceptance of the Grand Oaks project as a completed project. So our board policy uh, requires that projects valued at over $1 million be accepted by the Board of Trustees before final payment can be made in the accounting. <clears throat> well, let me, see, let me rephrase. Before we can make the final payment to the contractor, we have to close the accounting and be accepted by the Board of Trustees. So we, the district, has certified that Grand Oaks High School project is complete. We have closed the accounting internally and, as I just mentioned, with an external auditing firm as well. So we accepted that the project is uh, substantially complete on June 18th is when we took possession of the building and then opened for school uh, a year ago uh, on time. So the financial review yielded savings on the project in the amount of $3,633,474.13. Okay. The district anticipates making a final payment to Duratech, our contractor, in the amount of approximately $1,290,683.54. So at this time, we're asking for your acceptance of the project as complete. Gentlemen, can I have a motion? So made. We have a motion. Second. 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 Discussion. Quick question. Yeah. Just, to, just to confirm that this, the, the project it was not over budget by... $25 million or more, was it? No, the project was not over budget by $25 million. It was not over budget. Uh, Mr. Rice can actually give you some more detail yeah. on that. Right. Yeah, if we look at the, you know, what was in the bond plan with the 2008, uh, I mean, 2015 15. bond referendum, you know, the budget was $141 million for the high school. It's actually going to be totally completed with ff &E at $148 million. So, the, so based off of the plan that we had for the bond, it's actually seven million dollars over budget, so that that is if we're looking at the plan. However, our GMP price when we got to GMP, there were a couple of mitigating factors that we had that our GMP was actually higher than we expected. First was in 2008 bond referendum, we had basically no inflation, and we were able to extend that bond referendum for over seven years. Correct. However, moving into the 2015 bond referendum, that first year we didn't plan for any inflation because we were in a no inflation period. However, we got hit with 6% 6 inflation. However, that DMP increased $138 million. Also, we had in that uh, the bridge. If y'all remember, we needed yeah. access to the rear of the school. We had to build that bridge. That added cost uh, to that high school. So that's really the difference uh, in the cost of that high school. What What is the, so the savings are represented from the GMP. What was the GMP amount? What was the total amount? Uh, the GMP was, uh, I think it's a little over $3.6 million savings on the GMP. Okay. I, you know, once we set the GMP easy, the, you know, the architects and, and the construction company really went to work and, and, and brought that back down to about, uh, you know, $3.6 million savings off of the GMP. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you clearing that up. You're welcome. And as we know, that bridge came in handy here recently. Mm -hmm. Yes. Indeed. Yes. yes. So. I would like to go a, and you don't have to do it tonight, but I would like to know what the cost per square foot of that building is minus F and E, okay? Just for the building, it, what, what we consider the plan itself. Mm -hmm. If so that's the, possible, please. Yeah, the, the, the construction. And, and, and also how many students it 
you know, how many square feet and how many, not, not just how many square feet, cost of square foot, and how many students it's designed or its capacity is to serve. Yeah, so we, we designed. So that we can make a fair comparison Sorry. to other districts. Yeah, so we designed Grand Oaks for a capacity of 3,000 students. And as Dr. Hines mentioned, that, that can vary based on programs, but that's on, the a, on a baseline model, that's what we say is 3,000 students. Now, the, the construction GMP at $136,808,619, which is what you approved at, at the board through phase one and phase two, it represents about $258 a square foot. 138,808? 136,808,619. Okay. And how many square feet? It's approximately 526,000 square feet on the main building. Thank you very much. Sure. Didn't expect to have that on top of your head. On top of that, man. I was, I was impressed. Impressive. Impressive. <laughs> Knew you were going to ask that. Even with that uh, A&M landing, it was impressive. <laughs> all right. So we have a, do we get a motion and second? Yes, or do we, yeah. Okay. Motion second. All in favor? Motion passes. All right. Next item. Um, select construction manager at risk for the new elementary school in the Cannon Creek Peter Zone. Mr. Foster. All right. Again, it's my pleasure to bring forward uh, for your approval the uh, selection of the construction, man construction manager at risk for a new elementary school in the Candy Creek feeder zone, which we're going to refer, refer to as flex school number 20. So our board policy uh, deems the uh, uh, construction manager, manager at risk project delivery method as the method that provides the best value uh, for our school district. And that's for projects in excess of $100,000. So we have a long and successful history constructing projects under the cement risk delivery system, as we've just evidenced with our, our performance at Grand Oaks High School. So it was uh, on time and we worked diligently through the effort and played defense against our budget to be able to bring money back, money back to the district. So in January of 2018, again, you, the board of trustees, we brought forward for your approval and selection a pool of architects and engineers to be designers for our next cycle of work. So at that time, um, we approved that pool <laughs> and we've selected uh, IBI as the architect to be assigned to flex school number 20. So IBI has designed the last three flex schools for our, for our program. So that would be Bradley, Clark, and Suchman. So it made perfect sense to bring them forward uh, for flex school number 20 moving in the future. So IBI has helped to uh, prepare an RFQ for a two-step selection process for the construction manager at risk. So with their help, we turned it over to our purchasing department. Purchasing published on our electronic bidding system, the RFQ, to which we had 11 firms respond uh, to the to that and, and deliver their qualifications for us to analyze and, and grade. So according to state law, we had five firms we were able to shortlist out of those 11. And we did shortlist five. We brought them in to participate in step two, to participate in the, the pricing, which is percentage of fees and general conditions and pre-construction services proposals. And then we brought them in for interviews so we could really you know vet them and ask the hard questions and find out who is who is the right value for the project. For this project, we selected Duratech Inc. as the offerer that presented the best value for Conroe ISD. We've also attached the ranking as a part of the approval item too. So if we were to fail in the negotiation with Duratech, we could move, we could terminate that negotiation and move straight to a negotiation with the second uh, highest ranked contractor. So, and it's important to, to note that the cement risk firm, uh, they'll be partnered with the IBI from now until uh, we get ready to bid the job on the open, mar open market. So Duratech and IBI, uh, if approved, would work together to develop a set of plans and work within our target budget criteria so that we can get to the point where we're going to advertise to the public. We're going to take bids from the public. And then at that time, we would request a, a GMP, a guaranteed maximum price contract, to be approved for the construction. So what we're asking for tonight is a selection of, this year, of the CM at risk, and we're going to be obligated to pre-construction services, which totals to $22,500 if we don't build flex number 20. Now, we all know that flex number 20 is an elementary school in the upcoming November bond election. Yeah. So there's some variables between now and construction that need to be need to be considered. But at the same time, we know we're going to build flex 20 at some point in the future regardless. So we're, we're buying the design now. And if we can't build it when we need to by schedule because of a bond, then we'll own the design and be able to do it in the future. So at this time, we're requesting your approval of the selection of the CM at risk for flex school number 20. I think I have a motion. I move we approve. Have a motion second. 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 Discussion? All in favor? 
motion passes. Thank you, sir. All right, item G, receive capital improvement update. All right, Mr. Foster. All right, now I'd like to take this time to bring you up to speed on our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. I'm gonna start you with Stockton Junior High. Stockton Junior High is scheduled to open in August of 2020. It's currently about 60% complete, which we consider to be on schedule for a project this size and magnitude. So we're looking at the overhead or uh, drone view of the, of the site from a little bit different perspective this month. So looking at it from the, uh, the rear of the site to the athletic portion, you're looking at the competition field, which is planted now. So it gets a full growing season in before we start having football practice on it. Mm. And the track infrastructure and the other things uh, that will be installed, you're seeing It'll get a rubber surface later in the, in the program, but you're looking at the asphalt surface now. What I do want to point out is on either side, the left-hand side of the screen and the right-hand side of the screen <coughs> are the uh, structures going in for our photovoltaic system. So yeah, it's our solar panels. Right so we do anticipate generating quite a bit of our power needs on site. Uh, so those processes are going in. And so over the next several weeks, we should be seeing panels go up and be reaping the benefits of the sun's power uh, over the next several weeks on that site during construction which helps reduce our cost uh, for power pretty, pretty dramatically during the construction site. Uh, and meanwhile, when we're not using it, we have an agreement in place with Entergy so to buy that power back from us. So we're gonna be able to uh, get ahead of our, our return by getting that project done a little bit earlier. Which, what, what do you anticipate? I mean, if you don't know, you can give it to me later. What do you anticipate the payback period for those uh, panels? Uh, when we originally presented it, we were presenting about a 10 year payback period. So the good news is, is we've gotten more efficient panels at a better price than we anticipated. So we've only made that return on our investment quicker. Oh. I, I need to add, is, are these uh, areas where the, it, it almost looks like they're <coughs> uh, barriers, you know, that go across the street, you know, mm -hmm. when they're working on the street, are those the areas where the, 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 the Let's see if I can get a mouse. So, oh, in other uh, words, where your mouse is, and yes. then back over here, closer to the building. Yes. Okay. My question is this: Obviously, it's a tremendous investment. Yes, sir. And they're going to be fenced off and locked up, and all those things. I mean, to the point to where you literally can't get to them. Yes, I mean. So I mean, and I'm going to I mean, say it's, you know, we're on a prison atmosphere, but there's a big investment there. Correct. So, but we also want them visible and accessible as a teaching tool for our students. So we are putting fence around them. So there's security lighting, there's security fencing. There's there's ways for us to maintain them so that our uh, so that we can tell if there's a, uh, any malfeasance going on within the boundary of the solar panels. Uh, so there's security lighting at each rack. There's security lighting at those perimeters. Uh, the fence is six foot high fence, so it's not a little fence. It's a it's a substantial fence. But we also have them positioned so that they'll be good tools for the mm -hmm. campuses nearby. So we wanted to put them where the elementary schools can see them from their backyards. And we also want to put them close so the junior high kids can, can see them from theirs. Now, in additionally, I mean, jumping from security into education, we're putting a monitor inside the junior high so the kids in the junior high can actually, actually see the power that's generated graphically uh, on the screen. But but the security part of the part, we want some of it available so the kids can get close and touch and understand. But generally speaking, we are. But that would that would be uh, that, that would be it's midnight. You know, correct. You know what I'm saying? When, yes. Okay. But we are protecting them for the midnight marauders. So to speak. Quick question on uh, did that include your anticipated R and M repair maintenance on that as well? You pay back? I mean, uh, it seems yes, like it's as a matter of fact, it did. Um, so in one of the good news is about getting the prices down. We were able to get a a very good, solid, uh, extended service period. So the initial five years of maintenance and, and care yeah, very good. Uh, is by the manufacturer of the systems. Uh, so that helps us learn. So our maintenance department, we're not, I don't anticipate to turn it over to Mr. Schrader's department on day one saying, good good luck. Yeah. So we've got a, a team built together so that we can learn how to take care of ourselves over an extended period of time, not just- Great, right. I appreciate that. It gives me a sense of confidence. This is uncharted territory for us. So mm -hmm. having that out. Uh, a quick question as well um, on this same subject. The cost of these units, is that built into, because I know we're doing it at the same time as Stockton, but is it part of the Stockton cost? Mm -hmm. So the cost, the GMP, the guaranteed maximum price we approved for Stockton Junior High included the, the budget for this, this system when we when we approved it. So there's no, we haven't been back to add additional money to the contract. It's held within that GMP. Right, but will there be a way 
because I, I can foreshadow saying that school costs so much money to build. Is there a way to, to, to show what the cost of the school was mm -hmm. and then also what the cost of school and this project as Absol well? Absolutely. So the, uh, the GMP item we approved actually has a single line item on the line item list for the solar uh, panels. Mm -hmm. So you could almost deduct that line almost straight off the bottom and, and, and be within a percent or two of the final cost. But I, th I think if, if you're presenting that, you have to look at that as an investment. And it actually has a return of the return on it um, in savings that we otherwise would be spending on Correct. electricity as opposed to uh, you do you do right but mm -hmm. but he but he's right there'll be those that want to just throw it in there and, and anyway but you buy peppermints they don't know what's the return on why, why we spend it so much on they keep me uh, happy that's what we don't have that. <laughs> I agree. it's a good investment you don't have that. Yeah, it's not <laughs> money well spent. I agree, but it, I mean, it, it is just that point that, that that will come up. It's like our the cost of our elementary schools. They're not really an elementary school; it's a flex school. So you're you're going K through six, not one through four. And so there's an added cost for that. The, the other quick question: um, I think I know what this is, but between the new school, Stockton, and is that Bosman in the picture? Yeah, Bosman is in the north part of the picture. What is that in between? Is that a soccer fields? So right. the up in this period, yes, sir. That is our our practice ball field. So that would be the practice okay. soccer field and the practice football field. So it's hard to see on the big screen, but there's goal post in there installed currently. <laughs> so I was looking for the pole Dr. Dr. Null asked if I remembered the line item for the solar panels, and we carried a budget of about two point one million for the solar investment. Okay, uh, and we've we beat that number by a pretty good margin. Nice. So I think the all in cost on the solar field is going to be. When, it, when it's all built, graded, and pretty, and we're satisfied with it from screw, it'll be about 1.8. I mean, so we 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 felt like we've reduced that by a significant margin. That's great. I, I'm not second guessing. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not second guessing that. I just mm -hmm. wanted to talk about it. Thank you. No problem, sure. All right. Well, good news is is that uh, Stockton. Uh, you know, I've been talking for the last couple of months. The next big milestone is getting the building dried in. So, uh, in looking at the building from the back, you see more of the masonry progress now. So, the masonry, the windows, the roof those drying and components are making their way around the building. So as you drive by the front door, we've only got one section of the building that's currently open and open to the elements, uh, but they're working to close that up currently and then installing windows across the front of the building uh, pretty much as we speak during these next few days. So the masonry contractor is, is making very good progress uh, and, and working uh, very well to make the, make the schedules work and get the building closed up as rapidly. So over the next couple months, it should close up and then we'll be beginning working on the inside in earnest, which has already started in the dry areas of the building. We're already starting the processes of priming and painting and bring the finishes in. So I'm reporting that the building is on schedule is not a not a surprise or a stretch. I mean, so it, it will open on time in August of 2020 uh, with no issues. So moving on to Conroe High School, where you know we've completed the building addition last winter break. Uh, we've completed the second floor renovation of the main campus. Now we're working on the first floor renovation of the main campus. And that progress is, is moving along well uh, also. So you can see here the framing, the walls, the, the corridors, the new classrooms are, are, are pretty well set up. The installation of the floor tile and all the new finishes that make the old match the new uh, are, are being installed currently. And our classrooms are coming together. You're seeing the magnetic uh, uh, coat of the wall for our floor, floor to ceiling, wall to wall marker boards that our high schools are getting currently. Uh, those are, are going in place. So that built, that project is on schedule and will be there through, uh, through the winter break. So when our <coughs> students return from the winter break in January, they will return to classes in the, uh, the completed project at Connor High School for their phase one. And that is our update. Mr. Parker, can we go back? Yes, sir. Uh, to the hallway. One more. For those of you who hadn't been there, that those those boxed in that's that ceiling that you raised it by a foot at least. I mean, I, it may be taller than that. Mm -hmm. And that that walkway is how much? Maybe two foot wide, at least. So we removed lockers from both sides of the walls. I mean, so the lockers themselves were two feet. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind too, we also moved the walls. So we re reorganized the classroom layout on the first and second floor of those buildings. So we tried to maximize everything and get the collaboration spaces that the new new campuses are, are benefiting from. As but well. specifically, the 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 travel halls uh -huh. ways are much wider. And, yes. And one of the common complaints of 
mobility of students. Yes, sir. Big, big addition to the <coughs> second floor that you've already finished. And congratulations on those. Well, I would, I mean, if I can yeah. thank the team that's out in the hallways, I sit at my desk in the PBK, who is yeah. PBK, Danny, uh, it up. Yeah, Dr. Guys. Null. Yeah. And I, I'm sure you're probably aware of this, but I don't know if the rest of the board is. This has actually provided an educational opportunity for some of the classes that are housed, like the architecture students have had a chance to go in and see the design going in in progress. Some of our CTE classes have had a chance to go in there and witness skilled trades at work and see what's going on. So, I mean, it's it's the fact that we're able to do that on a campus that's under construction and still get educational use out of a construction site, well, just like this, the this PV panels you're Yeah, even about. and beyond that, our, our close, you know, knit, relationship with Conroe High School because of this is, I mean, we've, we've hosted, uh, I think we've hosted nine academy uh, interns, mm -hmm. and we had two interns out of the uh, Mr. Kamstorf's drafting program over the last, last uh, school semester uh, in the spring. I mean, so we have used this even in our department to bring, you know, some new, new educational opportunities that we hadn't present, had been presented with before. I don't want to embarrass anybody who, who, who uh, who said it or anything, but uh, I, I understand that the project manager over there is so well liked that uh, uh, there, there would be one wet, mad, mad, mad principal if, if it changed. So, I mean, <laughs> that, that speaks very highly for the team that's working together. Over there. I agree. Yes, I'm, I meant that as a compliment. Somehow it just didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, Miss Smith, try the late the lady, try right? no matter. Let's get this and, moving. <laughs> But uh, the, the contractor team that's over there works with Miss Smith and Randy Harris very well. I mean, so that's what that is. It would be a compliment I can absolutely pass on to. Them, so. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. That's all I've got. Thank you, sir. All right. We're on item six. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, did you say eight? Six, eight. Six, <laughs> Consider six, approval of 2019 2020 estimate and estimated annual expenditure. Yes. Uh, Mr. Rick Reeves will come forward and be presenting the next three items for us tonight. All right. Thank you, Aaron. I want to stay up for a while. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Null. Tonight is my pleasure to recommend that the board approve the estimated annual expenditures by category for the 2019 2020 fiscal year to the vendors detailed below and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute contracts with the vendors not to exceed the aggregate estimate for each category. So each school year, the district estimates expenditures by category to vendors who have been selected in accordance with state and federal procurement laws and board CH, CV, and CV local, legal and local policies. The board is asked to approve the expenditures by category for the coming fiscal year to authorize the superintendent to negotiate contracts as needed and to delegate to the superintendent the authority to execute those contracts. Purchases that exceeded the budget category amounts will be brought to the board for approval as well as a selection of additional vendors as required by state and or federal law or district policy. Estimated expenditures by category, including vendor name and method of purchase are detailed on the report. Methods of purchase that can be utilized are determined by what provides the best value to the district and include competitive bidding. A catalog, pur catalog purchase as provided by government code chapter 2157 subchapter B which includes your state vendors, your co-ops, um, regional state purchasing cooperatives, interlocal agreements, or a sole source vendor determined by state and federal purchasing guidelines. At this time, I request your approval. We have a motion a second? Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Now you presented it so well, I probably would have approved <laughs> it even. <laughs> I was ready about that. You know, I didn't agree with it. Yeah, that sounds good, man. Let's go with it. <laughs> All right, item uh, 6B, consider award RFQ, RFP, uh, 1905, yep. school buses. I was reading. Uh, once again, it is my pleasure to recommend that the board approve RFP 190504 school buses to Thomas Bus, Gulf Coast, and Rush Bus Centers for an estimated expenditure of approximately $1.65 million. Um, requests for proposals pertaining to the purchase of school buses for the district were emailed to registered vendors through the electronic e-bidding system. Three vendors submitted a bid response. The request for proposal was advertised two times in the courier. Unit prices were requested for new build diesel and propane school buses that meet or exceed specifications and to remain firm through August 2020. These buses will be used for replacing buses that have met their life expectancy, as well as those identified in the Volkswagen program grant and also for student growth. 
Proposals and recommendations were evaluated by members of the Transportation Department and reviewed by the Purchasing Department. Funds for this purchase are provided for in the Capital Maintenance Fund. At this time, I recommend your approval. I have a motion. So moved, they approve. I have a second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? I have one question real quick. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So in relation to the buses, once they arrive, we purchase them. Is there any additional work that we have to do them? Or are they pretty much ready for service? We would see them probably answer that. We still have to add yeah. zone arms. I mean, there may be some prep, them. or I'm not thinking not, along those lines. Is, is there any additional items that we have right to there. have for those? I, I didn't it see Sam. Depends on how the bus is going to be received. Um, most of the time, the buses will come to the vendor uh, pretty much ready. But vendors sometimes will elect to finish outfitting the buses with maybe digital systems, uh, the camera systems. Okay. Uh, a lot of it we. we like for them to go ahead and install before we accept them though they're already done and that's yes. a part of our correct. purchasing contract correct. that's correct that's correct. what i need thank you the licensing and trading as well logo uh, well right. i was thinking about the camera systems and oh, okay. some other internal right. things right i can make sure that they're coming completely almost ready to right drive correct. 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 Understand. all right all right thank you we have a motion second all in favor all right motion passes all right, so um, award RFP 1906-02, Fleet Repair Service. All right. It's my pleasure to recommend that the board award RFP 1906-02, Fleet Repair Service, to the 29 vendors listed for an estimated annual expenditure for approximately $750,000. Requests for proposals pertaining to the purchase of fleet repair services for the district were emailed to registered vendors through the electronic e-bidding system. 32 submitted a response. The request for proposal was advertised two times in the courier. The service contract will be valid for one year through September 2020, automatic renewing additionally annually for two additional one-year terms through September 2022 for a three-year agreement. Uh, pr proposals were evaluated by the maintenance and transportation departments and reviewed by the purchasing department. Funds for the purchase of fleet repair services are provided in the CISD general fund. Best value offers are recommended for board award, and at this time, I recommend your approval. Motion. Moved. Second. Motion second. Discussion? All in favor? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. Great job. That's done. All right. Item 6D, consider, consideration and approval of an order authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of Conroe Independent School District Unlimited Tax Refunding Bond Series 2019, authorizing the uh, superintendent and chief financial officer to approve the amounts. Mr. All right. Dr. No, Rice. Mr. Rice. Yes. Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noel. Tonight, I'm recommending that the Board of Trustees approve the order authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of Conroe Independent School District Unlimited Tax Refunding Bonds, Series 2019. This will authorize the Superintendent and Chief Financial Officer to approve the amount, the interest rates, price, redemption provisions, and terms thereof, and certain other procedures and provisions related thereto, and containing other matters related thereto. Uh, the perimeter order is for the sale of Conroe Independent School District's refunding bond series 2019. This order was prepared by ORC, which is the district's bond council. Mr. Marcus Dietz here this evening. If y'all have any questions, oh, he moved over here. He moved on. If y'all have any questions concerning the order, he will be here to, uh, you know, to answer those. <clears throat> the district expects to issue approximately $75 million in refunding bonds. The current estimated savings and debt service is approximately $8 million. And this represents a savings of approximately 9% on the projected debt service uh, for the refunding bonds. Um, Mr. John Roebuck, our district's financial advisor is here this evening to uh, give you a presentation on the schedule of events. Mr. Roebuck. Mr. Rice. They kind of stole my thunder with that savings number. <laughs> <laughs> President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noel, John Roebuck of BOK Financial Securities. Uh, we have a presentation uh, tonight for you guys to talk about the refunding opportunity the district has to save some interest cost savings on some outstanding bonds. Before I get started on the savings, I do want to go through the bond market. This is the bond buyer index. This is a weekly average of municipal bond markets in the uh, country, out of the country. Um, if you look on the far right, the current rate is a 3.07. It's actually dropped since I gave this presentation to Darren. It's now at 2.85%. Right. So it's about five basis points off of all-time lows. Now, saying that, this is a weekly average. came out last Thursday. Really about wow. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of last week, mm -hmm. rates have jumped up about 25 basis points. So we've seen a, we've seen a spike in rates. We're still in a very low interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. So we take advantage of that 
it generates some interest cost savings and get some savings for the, for the district. So what we're proposing is doing a refunding of four bond issues, uh, the 2004 Bs, the 2009 and the two, uh, 2011 series, the new money and refunding bonds. They have interest rates of about 3.375 uh, all the way to 5%. And based on today's markets, we can issue new bonds at a lower interest rate and generate savings for the district. And uh, the estimated savings we're showing, uh, Mr. Rice stole my thunder, about a little over $8 million total savings. Over the next, I believe it's uh, six years, it's a short refunding. It's about $1.3 million a year in savings. Uh, to accomplish this, we're going to ask you tonight, we're actually already on the almost in the middle of this agenda or the schedule here, ask you to approve the parameter order like Mr. Rice talked about, finish the official statement, which we already have a draft copy. Right here, we send this document out to potential investors. It talks about your, the history of the financials, history of the district, uh, state law, um, current school funding laws, and then uh, attract investors, and then we'll sell the bonds potentially on October 14th, depending on the market, and then close on November 18th, at which point we'll recognize the savings for the district. So moved. Second. So just to go for discussion. Yeah. So I'm sorry, motion second discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, love the idea. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. There is a savings, but we're not extending we are not terms of are these not. bonds, correct? correct. Part, part of the payment order we're asking you to approve does not allow us to extend the, the, the maturity structure of the bonds we're refunding. It's got to match up the maturity length. Okay. It's purely and an interest cost. Transaction cost costs as well. Transaction is, is net of transaction costs. Right. So the $8 million savings is spread over the length of the of the terms of these bonds and, and, and the ones you're recommending have maturity dates of different times. Exactly right. If, right. if you look here, and I probably should have gone through more of this, in the middle columns here, the less the, the debt to be refunded, that is the interest and principle of the bonds we're looking to refund. And it goes out through 2026. And if you look at the next two columns, the principal and interest on the new bonds, the 2019 refunding bonds, we are not extending the principal structure past 2026. That's awesome. Okay. That's a nice chart. All right. Thank you. All right. We have a motion second, gentlemen. All in favor? Motion passes. Thank, Thank you all. Appreciate it. Robert. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, item 16, <coughs> received financial reports. Mr. Ryan. Thank you. I'm here to present the financial statements for the month of uh, August. This is our year end, so I will tell you when you see the financial statements that come out after the audit, they will be different from what you're seeing tonight because these are unaudited. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, just not material. Not not material. <laughs> not not material. Right, I got you. You're correct. <clears throat> I just noticed that we're missing the first slide. <clears throat> can you can you pull this up here? Thanks. I think we're by chance again. There we go. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulty. Uh, the first statement we'll look at this evening is our balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheet, as we all know, includes our assets, our liabilities, and our fund balances. Uh, once again, we'll concentrate here on our general fund, and each month uh, we like to take a look at our cash and investments. Uh, in the general fund, we have cash on hand of $14,100. We have bank deposits of $6.5 million. We have investments with the state pools of $45.8 million. Uh, investments with Wood Forest National Bank, $91.4 million. And our longer-term investments uh, with TCG Investment Advisors, $51.3 million for total cash and investments of $195.1 million. We can also look at our property tax collections. You know, this is the end of the year. You can see we're just about where we were last year. And by the time we finish up all the reconciliation and everything, we'll exceed that 100% collections. The next statement we'll look at is our uh, income statement. Our income statement includes our revenues and expenditures. And fund balances, our revenues are broken down into three categories that include local and intermediate sources, state program revenues, and federal program revenues. And looking at the detail of our local and intermediate sources, you can see once again property taxes is the largest generator of revenues in our general fund and debt service, its food sales and food service, and its premium contributions and self-funded insurance. We can also look at our 
expenditures uh, year to date by major category. And as you can see, payroll is the largest expenditure in the general fund. Debt service in the debt service fund, supplies and materials and child nutrition and contracted services in our self-funded insurance plan. This is the status of our 2015 bond referendum. Um, as you can see, most of our projects are nearing 100% complete if they're not there already. Uh, we've already encumbered and expended $503.4 million. We have an estimate to complete of about $16.6 million, um, giving us a project forecast of the full program of $519.9 million. And that'll leave us a remaining balance of about $8.5 million of the contingency left in the program. Uh, Self-funded insurance, uh, July and August, they minute, were... Please. Let's yes, take up just a minute to yes, go sir. back to that $8 million. Yes, sir. There's been some questions about, you know, how we estimate jobs over a four-year bond, or, you know, period, mm -hmm. and with inflation and so on and so forth. This $8.5 million, just, I think I understand, but just for clarity, clarity, mm -hmm. okay, that is... We, we built a contingency in because we didn't know, and that's the contingency that's left. Yes, if you look at the first column, we had a contingency of a little over $23 million, yeah. and we have a little over $8 million left. Yes, sir. Okay. So it's in, in that $8.5 million can be used for a project that we did not describe in this bond, okay? Yeah, because it's, 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 it's sold, but it's not. I mean, Correct. That's pretty close on however many million it was, I don't know. Yes, what, roughly four, 500 million. 500 million, whatever it is. 487. Okay. 487. But, but that's exactly what it's designed to do. I mean, we hope it comes in less, but that the difference between that 23 and 8 was nothing more than inflation on that job. Yes, sir. Or a change order because we found we needed to build a sinkhole. A sinkhole, like whatever. Yes, sir. You're okay. correct. You are. Thank you. And so you can see the importance of contingency is really... At, yeah. Okay, back to our self-funded insurance, uh, July and August. You know, August, uh, we were watching that very closely this year. Um, the month of August, uh, you know, came in with uh, revenues over expenses of about $830,000. However, uh, the program as a whole uh, came into the positive. We had total revenues of uh, $49.6 million. We had expenses of $49.2 million leaving us with revenues over expenses of $416,000. So the program uh, was very successful this year. Uh, participation in our wellness centers, uh, very strong this year. Um, we averaged uh, 525 per month. Break even on the, on the clinic is 500. So we exceeded that. And so we're very happy with that. Taking a look at our investments for the month, uh, par value of our complete portfolio, $290 million. Uh, the pools were yielding about 2.3%, along with Wood Forest National Bank. Our longer-term investments with TCG Investment Advisors, the WAM was 424 days, yielding 2.152, uh, giving us a combined portfolio with a WAM of 79 <coughs> days, yielding 2.283. And you can see our benchmark, which is the 90-day T-bill, is at 1.94. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Alan. All right. Um, item nine here, legal nominations, nomination for 2020-2021 Montgomery Central Appraisal District Board of Directors. Dr. Noel, Mrs. Gladys. Gladys. Thank you. Your favorite item. Now, it seems like every time we turn around, we bring this item, doesn't it? Tonight, we have several things you need to do. First, the item nomination is a choose to make any to make up for five for the board of directors. Last um, time we made nominations, you nominated uh, Mr. Luzzi, Mr. Blanche, and Mr. Tuck um, to the board. There were other entities, as you know, all the entities of government in Montgomery County have the opportunity to nominate candidates to the board. Um, we'll submit those in after you make your nominations. We'll ask you to approve a, a resolution that will really impact submitting the nominations for inclusion on the ballot. And then uh, once all of the entities make their nominations, the ballot will be developed and sent out to the voting jurisdictions who have the most votes, um, from the largest passing jurisdiction. And then you have to we'll make your vote in November on, on the jurisdiction board. Um, so nominations are what's 
Mr. President, I'd like to open the nominations and include Barry Blanton's name again. All right. Mr. Blanton, we did last. We nominated. Okay. I'd like to do the same for Mr. Tuff as well as Mr. Luzzi, who expressed a desire to return to the board. I move to close nomination. I have a motion to close nomination. Second. Second. A second. Mr. Discussion. Discussion. All right. So, um, now move. We approve the three nominations. Motion to approve. We have a motion. We have a second. And discussion. All right. All in favor. Motion back. And I'll just use. It's okay. The same. Same uh, formula. Formation items we used at last time. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Motion to adjourn. Let's get out of here.